and welcome to tonight's talk, which is about uh, the uh, community parish history of Bremel. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be welcoming Martin and Louise, and to also to say that uh, this talk has been organised in conjunction with Victoria Vac uh, County History, the Wiltshire Victoria County History. So, uh, Martin, I think you're start you starting. Over to you. Great, thank you very much, David. Let me just grab the screen, um, and. Um... Right. Louise, is it the only person I can hear? Is that is that showing properly on your screen? Great. Um, well, good evening, all. Um, we're going to talk a bit about the Bremhill Parish History Group. Um, the Bremhill Parish History Project was formally started in 2018 to research, record and share the heritage of our parish in North Wiltshire and the story of its community over the last thousand years or so. Um, I'm Martin Nye, um, I chaired the group, um, and I'll be talking about the origins of the project and how we ran it. Uh, Louise Ryland Epton was our professional historian. Um, she coordinated the research and writing, and she'll talk tonight about the sources we used and some of the fascinating stories um, that we uncovered. We'll wrap up um, with some questions, uh, sorry, some lessons learnt, um, and describe what we're planning to do next and take any questions. So I've failed the first thing, which was to move the slide on initially. So here you can see a marvelous um, panel of, of, uh, of the parish, <coughs> an old um, extract of an old map and the memorable Maud Heath's monument, um, famous um, in Pevsna for saying that the quality of the doggerel on it matches that of the statutory. Um, so, um, before going um, any further, we should probably tell you a little bit about the parish of Bremhill. Um, it's a large parish of some 7,700 acres. It nestles between Carn and Chippenham. Uh, it's got a population, according to 2011 census, of about 967 residents um, in 378 households, nine separate settlements, Foxham, uh, Titherton Lucas, East Titherton, Chalcot, Spurthill, Stanley, Bremhill, Wick, and Bremhill itself. And the proliferation of settlements certainly made the task of writing a parish history much more interesting and, and more complicated. Um, the boundaries, however, have remained remarkably consistent since the 11th century. On the left, um, as you're looking at the slide there, you can see a, um, an interpretation of an 11th century charter, which uh, delineated in tremendous detail the, the shape of the parish and on the right, the current parish structure. The only real difference is that Titherton Lucas came in from Chippenham um, in, the, in the 20th century. Um, we knew there was plenty of physical history around. Um, there are 101 listed buildings and monuments in the parish. We've got a former abbey, Stanley Abbey. We've got three churches, a handful of chapels, several manor houses. We've got lengths of Maud Heath's Causeway. We've got a bit of the Wilson Barks Canal. We've got a small part of the Great Western train line. But as there'd been no attempt to, since the early 19th century to pull the whole thing together into a history, we didn't quite know what we were going to find. Um, I was approached by the Wiltshire Victoria County History Trust back in 2016, um, asking for some help to raise money to pay for the research for the Bremhill chapter of the what was then the new volume 20 um, on Chippenham and surrounding parishes. Um, Whilst I've always been a great admirer of the VCH and was very keen to help, I felt that the fundraising task would be easier and, and in fact more engaging if we set about producing a more accessible community history book at the same time, with the same research rigour as a VCH book, but with a wider remit and a broader range of contributors to the research and writing. Um, I went looking for other examples of that sort of book um, that I thought we should produce. And there are surprisingly few examples of local histories that are both well researched, um, accessible and attractively presented. Um, to some extent, we were trying to replicate what the VCH had done at some decade or so ago with a series called England's Past for Everyone. Uh, and they produced a very handsome volume on the village of Codford in South Wiltshire, which John Chandler um, was instrumental in putting together. Lots more images and graphics than a classic big red VCH book 
going into much more detail on the local social history than you'd ever find in a VCH project. Uh, once we had started the project, John told me just what a nightmare it had been to pull the Codford book together. Um, but I'm glad we didn't know that when we started off. Um, so the first thing I'd, I did, uh, hold on, I dropped a slide. I've got the, my order wrong, here we go. Um, the first thing I did was pull together a, a local steering group. And that was probably the most important thing I did in the whole project. Um, either by luck or good judgment, we ended up with three fantastic committed individuals with a range of skills and experience um, and indeed enthusiasm that was um, relevant and helped drive the project. So Helen um, uh, with first rate financial and project management skills, Sarah with marketing and social media expertise, and John who's on the call tonight, so I better be nice to him, with an extraordinary range of design and production abilities. And then we got some really good help from um, uh, on the IT from Craig, who's also on the, on the call tonight. Um, all these people were very well plugged into the local community and enthusiastically got involved with fundraising as well as research as the project developed. Um, this local group was admirably supported by the Wiltshire VCH, uh, in particular by Chris Caswell and James Holden. Um, and in time, we set up local village coordinators, which was very necessary given the dispersed nature of the parish. Um, and that proved very effective at reaching out into the, uh, into the community. Um, we then set about trying to find a professional historian to coordinate the research and writing. That was difficult too. That was surprisingly difficult. We had a number of very unproductive conversations with what I shall describe as an eclectic range of characters and some very helpful people who tried to point us in the right direction. And eventually our friends at Wiltshire VCH introduced us to Louise. Um, Louise was completing her PhD uh, with the Open University at the time. And straight away, we were convinced that she was the right person to help us with the project. Um, now, then money was the next thing. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, we, we successfully raised nearly 30,000, uh, well, in the region, 30,000 um, pounds, but it wasn't plain sailing. Um, we built an initial project plan and budget, and with what turned out to be rather misplaced um, confidence, submitted it to the National Lottery Heritage Fund, who we were hoping were going to provide some half of the total we were looking for, and we were turned down. Um, but not without some very constructive criticism and some encouragement to think bigger and wider. What they wanted to see was a project that was not just about a VCH chapter in a book, but it was a whole community program in, engaging with a, as broad an audience as possible, giving people new skills um, so that they could get involved with research. So it was back to the drawing board. Uh, we produced a really first rate, all singing, all dancing project plan, which of course, um, ultimately we had to deliver, um, but that got funding support second time around from the Heritage Lottery Fund, and we got some great support from other local grant making organisations. And I've put them all up here because we're particularly grateful for their support. And I think there may be a few representatives of some of them on the on the call today. So I don't want to forget anybody. We had the Carn Area Board, the Victoria Wiltshire Victoria County History Trust, the Braden Stokes Solar Park Community Benefit Fund. Renville Parish Council, the Chalcot Reading Room and Library Fund, the Friends of St Martin and the Friends of St Nicholas, two churches within the parish, and the Chalk Valley uh, History Trust. So they all made um, significant financial contributions without which we could not have started the project, let alone uh, completed it. And they were all tolerant and supportive of the changes and delays um, that came about during the course of the project. More on that in a moment. So, um, the programme we, we designed um, was uh, included workshops, uh, research training sessions, walks around the parish, some talks, some oral histories and some test pitting. And the idea was this all was going to culminate in the Bremhill Parish History Festival. And the idea was that we had a body of output that we could use in a different variety of formats. So some of it would go into the VCH chapter, some into the community book but also some of it would appear in talks on the website and in a series of articles in the parish magazine and through a, a heritage app and in schools material, all the common body of material. Um, through some early kickoff events uh, and some publicity in the parish magazine, we got an email list of about 80 people. We were very proactive and uh, put posters up and flyers and advertised all the events we were doing. 
we were keen to get as many people as possible and, and people joined us. We, we visited the Wiltshire Museum. We visited the History Centre in Chippenham. We had some training workshops. Uh, we covered topics as diverse as reading and interpreting old documents, maps, understanding wills and inventories, understanding census returns, how to record oral histories. All was going swimmingly well. Um, uh, although, as I will describe a bit later, it did prove more difficult to get persuade people to be actively involved in research. Um, it was quite easy to get people to turn up to social events and talks and concerts, strangely enough, especially if you laid on refreshments. Um, anyway, we did succeed in developing a hard core of research volunteers who did a lot of work and they developed all sorts of enthusiasms, researched a very wide range of topics, some of which ended up in the book, some on in articles in the parish magazine or on the website, and some are yet to see the light of day. And who, who, who knows what will happen then? Anyway, along came the pandemic, um, which required a very rapid um, rethink. So we decided that it was important to keep the project going and that we could make a lot of progress online. So we, like the rest of the world, became, let's say, semi-competent at Zooming. Um, it was absolutely worthwhile um, as doing during the both the first and the second major lockdowns. It was very clear that the online talks and the training sessions provided a very important um, point of social connection for people in the parish, and they were very appreciative of that. We had to adapt our plans somewhat dramatically, um, particularly for the parish history festival. So we had to we had a marvelous vintage coach ride toured around the whole of the parish with all the historical sites featuring that had to be um, uh, abandoned. And so we, for the first history festival, we focused instead on a series of evening talks over a September weekend in 2020. Um, at that same time, we launched the Heritage Trail app uh, and that Craig uh, had, had developed that um, and that was a huge success. A lot of detailed material about each of the dozen or so sites that we chose around the parish um, and people could access it <coughs> on, the, on the weekend itself. There were there were displays at all the locations um, and they could also use their phone to, to get really quite detailed information and to decide whether they want to do the whole walk or two or three smaller sub walks. <coughs> that first weekend we had 200 participants with people of all ages exploring the parish on foot, by bicycle, uh, on horseback or, or, or by car. Um, the, the second festival um, uh, and the book launch in 2021, in December 2021, we were actually able to do, um, holding our breath slightly uh, in, in real life. Um, this was attended by nearly 70 people, um, the maximum we could accommodate given the need for social distancing in Bremhill uh, Village Hall. We had a range of fascinating talks. Um, Simon Kerry talked about the Lansdowne family in the parish, David Wood about some of the interesting people buried in the churchyards of the parish, Simon Draper on some fascinating um, theories on Roman and Anglo-Saxon settlements within the area, and Julian Orbach on the remarkable buildings of the parish. For anybody who's interested, all of those talks are available on the Bremhill Parish website. Um, we also had a children's festival, which was an enormous amount of fun, um, quite chaotic at times, but, 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 but delightful. You can see from some of these pictures that the enthusiasm with which the participants entered into it. Um, we, the children made potions, that they had storytelling sessions, they decorated biscuits to look like the tiles from Stanley Abbey and lots of dressing up and strangely people gravitating towards nasty, pointy, dangerous things. Um, all delivered by Louise and local volunteers with significant help from Ali from the museum, for which we were very grateful. Um, she was um, a, a beacon of calm whilst there was a lot of excitement going on. Um, it made a good deal more mess than the adult festival, despite having rather fewer participants, but we got great feedback, even from the teenagers involved. Um, our school's work, I think it would be fair to say, was one of the few areas where we really felt that we'd not achieved all that we set out to achieve because of the pandemic. The schools were not keen on welcoming visitors in, onto their sites. We'd originally planned to go and do um, train students into how to do oral history interviews. Um, nonetheless, we've got some educational materials for Key Stage 1 and 2, which is, um, has been produced. We tested some of that at, at the Children's Festival and we're going to put it on the website in, in, in due course. 
Um, we, uh, my, my sequencing has, got, has gone out here. Um, we did some geophysical um, investigations and test pits um, with the archaeology field group in Foxham and in Bremhill, uh, looking for evidence of Roman occupation on the top of the hill in Foxham, near, near to the Lynham Air Base where um, Robert Pegler, a local farmer, had reported numerous finds of, of, of what he, we thought was Roman or Romano-British pottery. The findings were frustratingly um, inconclusive. There's some clear evidence of those sort of period wastes, some trenches, some enclosures, but no real structures. Um, we'd like to do some further investigations, but we weren't able to do it at the time. We also um, worked with Mike McQueen, who I can see is on the call today. Mike was a, a, a great help and enthusiastically came and uh, looked for signs of earlier construction around the sites of Cadenham Manor and Bremhill Manor. Again, I think without any clear signs um, at the first um, uh, uh, investigation of, of what had been there before. Um, and as you, as you would have seen from the earlier um, slide of, of the programme of activities, we, we people got involved in the test pitting um, and a lot of involvement in all the talks. It was, we had good community involvement. Um, we did keep track of attendance and over the course of the whole program, um, we reckoned we had direct engagement with <coughs> um, some 600 people. Um, there'd have been some duplication in that, but nonetheless, a pretty um, impressive number. <coughs> Excuse me. So moving on to the written outputs, um, the VCH chapter was finished in good time, and that's been made available online on the Wiltshire VCH site for some time now. And that's got all the usual detail of primary sources um, so that it can be used by future historians. I think physical publication of that volume is not expected for another couple of years. Um, the material we collected is, is um, there's a lot of it available on our website. Um, and uh, typically our website is getting about 200 unique users a month who connect to look at about a thousand page views. Um, and I mentioned the app earlier, we, we, there've been a 250 downloads of that app in total, and we've got about 145 um, members on Facebook of the Bremhill Parish History Group. So um, a, a lot of community involvement. Um, and now onto the book itself. Um, You've got a picture of it there, and here's a, the splendid volume in my hands. Um, Louise has got hers, very good. Um, I, I must say, I have a newfound appreciation of how much work goes into any book, particularly one with lots of illustration and lots of footnoting. It, it really does take an extraordinary amount of effort. Louise wrote the book with contributions from over 30 volunteers who were involved in research, photographs and illustrations, writing up case studies and contributing to the editing and indexation. She was greatly helped in this by John Chandler and Elio Carson, a retired professional editor that I managed to find from my uh, network. And we were most fortunate to have John Harris taking the lead on this, um, contributing for free over 600 hours on the design, artwork, illustration, and production of the book. This Herculean effort ensured that the finished product was high quality, accessible, and tremendously visually appealing, uh, which has been in, an in, crucially important part of its success. Um, we've nearly sold out now of the initial print run of 350 that we did. We sold books directly through um, throughout the parish, through the uh, village coordinators, through the local pubs, through local museums and through Waterstones in Chippenham. Uh, the book was extremely well received by the local community. Um, and we surveyed them all at the end of the project, and I'll tell you a bit more about that um, at the end of the talk. Um, and we got some fantastic feedback from Professor Catherine Clark, who's the uh, head of the Institute of Historical Research. I won't read the whole quote, but she says, the book is sumptuous and full of beautifully researched local history. Huge congratulations to all involved a real beacon for the highest quality co-produced history. I think we, we would take that um, praise all day long. And then just in the last week or two, we've heard that the book um, has been awarded joint first prize in the Alan Ball Award for the best local history book. So um, we're very excited about that. So I'm gonna stop now and hand over to Louise, who's gonna tell you 
more about the sources we used and some of the stories we unearthed. Louise, over to you. Thank you, uh, Martin, um, for that uh, great insight. Um, hearing it back makes me so proud of everything that we uh, achieved over the three years. Uh, historical research is frustrating and time consuming, but in this project, it led um, to the discovery of some fabulous stories and insights into the history of the community of Bran Hill. In conducting uh, research for the Wiltshire Victoria County History Trust, we are meticulous and obsessed with primary um, sources. And by primary source, um, I mean something produced at the time um, being researched. So it could be an entry in a parish register, a map, a, a newspaper report, a manor survey, something of that ilk. The distinction between a primary and a secondary source, which is written after the event, is not always clear. Uh, the first historian of the parish wrote his history of it in 1828. So in a sense, it was both a primary and a secondary source. Its author, the Reverend William Lyle Bowles, was um, wonderfully opinionated and free with his um, anecdotes about the par parish in the time that he was um, writing in and also in the parish um, prior to that. In approaching the book, we tried to have a similar mindset to the BCH, so much of the research has involved accessing undigitized primary resources at archives and digitized ones online. Our main archive was at the Wiltshire and Swindon History Centre in Chippenham, and there you can access for free many of the um, original documents that we used during the duration of the project. The centre also have an extensive range of books. Uh, these include uh, local place-based histories, works on different aspects of Wiltshire history, from cheese making to cloth production, trade directories, and lots of general and reference books um, by uh, the Wiltshire VCH for one, and also those published by the Wiltshire Record Society. Those were particularly helpful. And these provide some great uh, context for local historians, or even in the case of the Wiltshire Records Society volumes, access to some primary materials presented in an accessible way. The centre also provides um, computers from which you can get access into um, online sources like Ancestry. So it was very um, uh, helpful to us in a number of ways. I would encourage anyone who hasn't already used the History Centre to give it a go. And I know that archives can be um, very intimidating if you haven't used them before, um, perhaps more so since COVID. But the staff really are um, very friendly and COVID protocols are still in place. Consequently, you do need to pre-book, but um, I would give anyone who is interested in local history a um, encouragement to give it a go. The situation of the pandemic meant, however, that the History Centre was closed for many months during 2020 and 2021, and our access to other archives was likewise restricted. So I wasn't able to access um, the archive at Bowood House, that's the seat of the Lansdowne family who owned much of the parish um, from the 18th century until the 20th. Although I'm very grateful to the curator and to Lord Carey, who were very helpful in answering my questions. My access to other archives at the Wiltshire Museum and to the National Archives at Kew was also stifled. Had I known in 2019 a global pandemic was coming, I would have accessed those archives more regularly and much earlier on. However, our friends from Wiltshire Museum assisted us with our queries and um, to create some educational resources and with our monthly talks and festivals to which um, Martin has alluded. Despite this, inevitably, um, circumstances meant that some parts of the research relied more heavily on primary materials that were available online than I had originally anticipated, and also on um, the oral history testimonies, some of which were gathered or had to be gathered on the telephone and via Zoom. Although the pandemic complicated the research, it never actually um, stopped, and we were able to adapt, I'm pleased to say. It was helped by the knowledge and the support of academics, museum staff, uh, local historians, and um, members of the Bremhill community, and other partners who didn't mind sharing their knowledge and expertise. 
uh, we asked a lot of questions. The transcription of wills and the research um, with census returns was possible with the help of volunteers who, who did that online. And over time, my resilience, oh, sorry, my reliance rather on certain volunteers increased. And there were a number of reasons for this, um, not just for the pandemic. For one, over the duration of the um, project, I got to know um, the interests and strengths of particular volunteers. So I found myself increasingly asking people to do particular pieces of research and to write sections of the text. When I conducted my first archival research back in the 1990s, nothing was available online. Thankfully, that has changed. It means that access to things like parish registers, census returns, probate records, newspapers, contemporary pamphlets, books, are now available from the comfort of your own home. This helped make research more accessible to um, volunteers over the duration of the project. And actually, we found that not everyone was willing even if the archive had been open to actually um, spend several hours at um, an archive in Chippenham in person. The proviso was, of course, that some of the uh, digital resources that we used online were behind a paywall. Personally, I was lucky um, as some of my resources I could access through my university affiliation and some of the database I, I used uh, are actually hard to access without one. Of the publicly available um, digital archives, and I'm mindful there are many, uh, I particularly liked the British Newspaper Archive, which was great for a number of Wiltshire newspapers. I also used uh, Know Your Place for access to digitised maps and Internet Archive for access to books. I also utilised Ancestry, and this was actually the repository that um, was most likely to be available to our volunteers. Uh, local parish registers and probate records held at the History Centre are actually available on the Ancestry site. And uh, although Ancestry is expensive, as highlighted earlier, it is accessible for free on the um, computers at the History Centre. Alongside these sources, uh, we also use the material generated by members of the Brown Hill community. Um, I've alluded to the interviews, but there was also information and artifacts in the form of photographs and letters, and this was invaluable, particularly in the creation of the final chapter of the book, which looks at the parish history of the 20th century to the present day. We also used archaeological data from historic England, and as Martin has discussed, that which was created on our behalf by the Wiltshire Archaeological Field Group. From this huge knowledge base, um, the talks, articles, and text of the book was created. But for me, the best bit of the book was the writing and the um, the writing of all the wonderful stories and, and characters that we discovered. We highlighted many women um, who stood up against injustice or did not conform to the social and economic expectations of their time. And as this is March, and it's actually Women's History Month, uh, a time to think about and celebrate the role of women in the past, it seems like a good moment to highlight some of those stories in particular. And there are many, very many examples uh, that I could uh, have used for this talk. Um, the women that we highlight include the uh, 18th century Moravian girls school headmistress Anne Grigg, who taught her pupils a progressive curriculum that included languages, geography and art. During the late 18th and early 19th century, students at the school also included several girls of mixed race, which was highly unusual at the time. Then there was the formidable Sarah Pegler in the early 20th century, who ran a 240-acre um, farm, which is still actually in the family today. One of a surprising number of women who we found running farms from the 17th century onwards disqualified due to her sex from bidding um, for the farm at an auction in 1910, Sarah had been forced to use a male proxy. 
Uh, she stood up time and again at military tribunals to argue for the military exemptions for her laborers during World War I. Uh, she was also an early adopter of technology, acquiring probably the first tract in the area in 1917 to 18. Actually, I was very moved by how proactive many local women were in their efforts to support the war, war efforts during the 1418 hostilities uh, and was pleased that, that we devoted a section of the book to them. And then there were those women who stood up and actually spoke out against injustice. And these included um, Lucy Simpkin and Mary Ferris. Lucy's speech at an anti Corn Law meeting at Bremhill in February in 1846 inspired Charles Dickens to pen a poem. Lucy appears in the book, but Mary does not. Um, both deserve, I think, to be remembered for speaking out when women's voices, especially those of poor women, were rarely heard. So I'm going to take a moment to describe Mary's role. Mary's efforts began in 1844. Uh, low wages and high food prices had created a situation in Bremhill where basic foodstuffs were increasingly out of reach of many working families. And by September, it was reported that some of the inhabitants had had no meat or dairy in their diet for several months. Children were visibly suffering from a lack of food. With the prospect of increased deprivation through the winter, a meeting took place at the Wesleyan Chapel in Bremhill at Spurt Hill. The proceedings became political and were, words were said against the aristocracy um, and the discussion turned to the role played by the Church of England and the state. However, most of the blame for the distress was laid at the door of the Corn Laws. These were government tariffs on imported um, goods designed to protect British farmers, but which actually stopped the importation of cheap foodstuffs into the country. Towards the end of the meeting, the chairman asked if there was anyone on the floor who wished to speak. And at this point, one woman responded, a chocolate labourer's wife by the name of Mary Ferris. Mary observed that many of the men in the meeting were afraid to, to speak for themselves. And she went on to give a poignant account of her family's struggles under the Corn Laws. She described how she lay awake at night and able to sleep for the ache of want of food and how her husband trembled for the lack of nourishment and found it difficult to work and how their children cried. Her speech was well received and I think it likely resonated personally with many in the crowd. The meeting was reported by many newspapers across the country, and I have to say as far away as Scotland. And it was even picked up by journals like, journals like The Economist. Most didn't print the more radical ideas that had been expressed, but all of them reported Mary's um, speech. The proceedings evidently convinced Mary to become politically active in the cause of free trade, and she went on to give speeches at a number of other meetings called to discuss local distress and the abolition of the Corn Laws. These included those at Gotaker, Lynham, and at Bram Hill. Generally, the only woman to speak, Mary's speeches were often well reported and primarily focused on her struggles to provide for her family on her husband's meagre wage. The Anti-Corn Law League cited Mary's example, and around the country, people were moved to send money to alleviate the local distress. These funds were distributed throughout the neighbourhood and was something that Mary believed saved her own family and one assumes a number of others from near starvation. Mary also called on women to join her in speaking out and at one assembly in support of free trade proposed that an all female meeting be planned to allow women the opportunity to make known their experiences under the Corn Laws. To the bemusement of the press which was present, the resolution in support of her proposal carried. And I think locally, Mary likely inspired Lucy Simpkin to make a speech which became immortalised in a poem by Dickens called The Hymn of the Wiltshire Labourers. Mary's testimony helped to bring the issue of the Corn Laws into the national consciousness and to the forefront of national politics. And in 1846, the matter was to split the Tory party and bring down the government of Prime Minister Robert Peel. But the Corn Laws that Mary blamed for her distress were finally abolished. 
Um, although Mary was very brave, I think probably the most courageous of the women that we actually um, feature in the book was that of um, Joanne or Joan Hale, who suffered religious persecution over four decades during the 17th century. Uh, Joan was the wife of a Chalcot farmer and a local Quaker. Uh, Martin, do you want to change the slide? Lightly inspired um, to become a follower by the visit of the Quaker evangelist George Fox to the village in 1657. Quaker teachings um, emphasize a direct relationship um, with God, rejected the sacraments, ordained ministers and set forms of worship. Uh, women were also allowed to take a leading role and even to preach. Quakers were persecuted, often given fines for their failures to pay tithes, something for which Joan's husband, Joan's husband, or Joanne's husband, David, was subpoenaed for in 1657 by the local minister, James Crump. Refusing counsel and to take off his hat in court, David was sent to Fleet Prison, where he remained for two years. Meanwhile, Joanne was threatened, her house broken into and goods stolen. Neighbours were warned to keep away. Uh, David eventually died in prison, allegedly, according to one account, by violence. And for the next 30 years, uh, his widow was subject to intimidation and prosecution, including for allowing her own home to be used as a Quaker meeting house and for refusing to take an oath of allegiance to the king. Her goods and property were consequently seized on a number of occasions, and at one point while she was ill, bailiffs took all of her household goods, including apparently um, her children's bed, bedding and clothing. A tale that didn't make it into the book um, about her was the fact that the local uh, vicar, John Townsend, used informers to infiltrate her meetings on one occasion, these informers seized four of her cows and placed them with the vicar's own cattle for several weeks, at which point a kinsman of the vicar pretended to buy them from the informers and return them back to Joanne. Uh, later, the supposed good, human the good Samaritan um, demanded money off her for um, their return, something that she refused to do. The uh, Samaritan then went to the magistrate who issued a warrant for the seizure of the cattle and the cattle were again taken from her. In 1690, shorty, shortly after the passing of the Act of Toleration, which allowed nonconformist freedom to worship, a Quaker meeting house was licensed at her home. The meeting house was administratively important within North Wiltshire. However, the prosecution of her continued at least until 1694, when she observed it was the 35th time she'd been charged for the non-payment of tithes. This amazing woman was to die two years later. My favorite tale in the book, however, involves um, another woman, but this time, um, the story is even more tragic. It involves an alleged witch, Agnes Miles. The story is um, complicated. Uh, it involves an elite family at war with itself, um, which in the period up to these events was embroiled in scandal and intrigue. It encompasses the courts of uh, Henry VIII, Mary and Elizabeth, and the list of outlying characters um, includes such personalities as Thomas Cromwell, Catherine Parr and Thomas Seymour. But at its core, it's about the death in 1564 of a baby, William Bainton, the heir of a fortune that included the manors of Bremhill and Stanley. His parents, Edward and Agnes, accused a local widow, Agnes, Miles with his with killing their baby by the use of witchcraft. In prison, Agnes confessed and further alleged that she'd acted at the instigation of the child's aunt Dorothy, whose own children stood to inherit if Edward and Agnes Baton failed to produce another heir. 
The circumstances of the legal case are murky, not least the fact that despite the accusation, confession and witness testimony, and related, I think, uh, to those circumstances, which I can't go into due to time, that corroborating evidence from a witch finder was also sought. However, once the witch finder had confirmed Agnes Miles's guilt, she was herself imprisoned. However, Agnes Miles was then hanged for witchcraft. Despite being mentioned in the Wiltshire Victoria County History Volume 6, published in 1962, this case has been overlooked um, by historians working on witchcraft. And I think there are probably many reasons for it. The documentary evidence for the case of Agnes comes from an unusual source for this type of research, the Court of the Chancery. The records of the original witchcraft trial at the Assizes are lost. If this Wiltshire case hadn't involved an elite family, knowledge of it and the context to it would probably be lost also. Crucially, it also predates the very first witchcraft pamphlet in 1566, um, which outlines the case against an Agnes Waterhouse, who's often called the first person to be executed in England for witchcraft. So the case of a convicted witch from Bremhill in 1564 is actually significant and not just in Wiltshire. Agnes Miles was one of the first, if not the first person to be executed for witchcraft in England. So I hope that gives you some idea of the stories that we uncovered in the period from the 16th century from the 20th. It's worth saying that the book is arranged in thematic chapters and starts with one on the landscape settlement and buildings of the parish, where we consider amongst other things, its geology, the meaning of local place names, early charters, archeology. span In the second chapter, we consider the development of transport links. And in these sections, personal stories are less relevant less evident rather, but the book is no less fascinating. In its writing, we created a pictorial map showing the boundaries of the Anglo-Saxon estate, which Martin showed us earlier. And in consultation with the landscape historian, Dr. Simon Draper, we suggest a new theory about the origins of the settlement of Bremhill. Thereafter, um, chapters look at particular aspects of life, um, such as the local economy, the role of religion, and so on. And these are threaded through with short anecdotes and larger case studies of particular people, some of which I have mentioned previously. Like so much of the project, the content and organization of the book was adaptive. Um, a chapter of the text highlights the 20th century because so many in the community wanted to know more about the parish at war. Likewise, a section on folklore, superstition and witchcraft wasn't part of our original book con concept, but it was actually necessitated by all the fascinating stuff that we found along the way. It was important to me that the book should reflect the lived experiences of all those who relied resided rather in the parish, not just the rich. And despite all the difficulties we encountered along the way, I think we actually did a pretty good job. In finishing, I'd just like to say that despite um, some challenging periods within its history, I was really impressed by the resilience and ingenuity of the community of Bremhill. Sometimes this made me smile, such as the 17th century recipe noted by a local farmer for a sore throat that involved mixing dog poo and honey and then applying it to the throat. Or the punishment of sexual transgression by the um, creation and dissemination of explicit dog rule. As a historian with a particular interest in social policy, um, I was really impressed too by how much support there was available within the community. Welfare provision developed here early. Uh, free medical care was available to the poor as early as the 17th, 1760s, something which um, I hadn't experienced um, outside of a, of a major town. Um, Bremhill also had a range of schools available by the early 19th century, at a time when the rector of neighbouring Christian Malford complained about the difficulty of getting one off the ground. Local friendly society provision developed in the 18th century, again not something that was established in Christian Malford until the mid-19th. 
So I think Brown Hill is a really special place and its history is truly fascinating. It's been wonderful to be part of the project and to um, write this fantastic book. So I'm handing back to um, Martin and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Louise. Um, and sorry for some slight discontinuities on the on this slide, uh, wrestling with the system here that I thought I understood. Um, just a couple of things to wrap up before we have some questions. Um, at the end of the project, we were required to submit an evaluation report to the National Lottery Heritage Fund, which is focused mainly on these things called target outcomes, which you get set as one of the conditions of the original grant. Um, and essentially, we, we had to um, demonstrate that the heritage was going to be better interpreted and explained and better identified and recorded and that people have developed skills and <laughs> learned about heritage and changed their attitudes and behaviours and quite big um, targets here. Um, had an enjoyable experience, volunteer time, well, that was more straightforward. Um, and ultimately, that more people and a wider range of people will have engaged with heritage. Um, and that your local area has to be a better place to live, work or visit. Well, um, I think the good news is that we think we did, we did make achieve all these outcomes. Um, we, we got some very positive feedback from many people who attended all the various events. Um, at the end of the project, we did a survey. Um, we, we asked a range of questions, uh, which included the question, to what extent has your local historical knowledge increased on a scale of one to four? And the average response was 3.4, so indicating a very high level of perceived increase of heritage knowledge. Um, and we got some very nice comments and quotes um, from the survey as well. Um, uh, I won't read them all out here, but I feel more connected to the present through knowing about the past, a greatly increased community spirit and pride in the area. It's brought the community together at a time which could have been quite lonely and it gives me a real sense of being in touch with our heritage. So some very um, uh, positive messages there. Uh, we, we genuinely believe that we've helped um, foster a greater sense of identity for the parish across the nine separate settlements. Um, people were brought together through the events, through the monthly updates, the, the two history festivals, and it's served as a sort of catalyst for an ongoing interest in the rich history of the parish. And there's lots of ideas um, bubbling around for future research and future talks and articles. We don't know for sure, um, but we believe the majority of households in the parish have brought a copy of the book. It was priced, we hope, affordably at 20 pounds. Um, free copies of the book have been given to libraries, museums, and the history centers in the area. And we're planning on giving some copies to, to, to local schools. Um, what have we learned? Um, what have we learned as a, as, a, as a group on this project? We thought it might be useful just putting together a few thoughts for anybody else who's contemplating such an endeavor. Um, you need a small, committed and focused steering group. Uh, it, it's, very, it's a lot of hard work. It required a, a more sustained level of activity than I think probably we had ever anticipated, but we had great people who were willing to spend time on it um, and help research and help um, produce the writing um, and produce the newsletters. Um, and we, we had a lot of fun along, along the way and regular, um, some high quality coffee and cake seemed to be quite a, a, an important motivational tool in that activity. Um, secondly, the support of professionals is invaluable. Um, we got support in help in training our volunteers and helping lay on events and visits in guiding Louise's efforts um, and in ensuring the quality of the finished output. Um, we, we were very willing to engage with um, people from the VCH and from um, other professionals in, in different walks of life um, and they took a lively interest in what we were doing um, and IT was another area with, with Craig's professionalism which really did help us uh, raise our game. Um, most people wanted to participate passively. Um, I think that's something one just has to accept. Um, it was quite easy to attract people to come along to talks and events, rather more challenging to get them to spend time learning new skills or doing research. Um, some half of the people we surveyed at the end had been to one of our skills workshops and 65% had attended a talk on at, at one of the 
the two festivals. So I think it's fair to say that people were interested, but it was a small core of volunteers who did all the heavy lifting on the research alongside the professional historians. And, and pleasingly, those people continue to conduct their own research with their with their newfound skills. Um, it probably made more difficult in our circumstance because of these nine different settlements across the parish uh, and the village coordinators help, helped um, bridge that. Um, fourth point, you can't over communicate. Um, we, did, we thought we did blanket communications um, across the parish magazine and social media and website and email. Um, and still you say people say, oh, what history project? Um, direct personal communications proved the best way to get people involved, much better than impersonal mass communications and word of, well, word of mouth recommendations were best of all. Um, and it, obviously some of the older inhabitants were simply not comfortable with electronic forms of communication, but having said that, some of them were the most deft at using them. So um, you, have, you have to communicate and keep communicating during a project like this. Using online tools, um, is essential for efficiency and reach. Um, as I said, we use Zoom for meetings and training and talks, and the, the whole of the first Bremhill History Festival was, was online. Um, probably if one was starting it afresh without a pandemic in, around, you probably would use some sort of hybrid model because the low effort involvement of people just dialing into a, into a Zoom talk probably would help engagement. But it's the real world events that are central to the engagement. It's, it's the physical talks, it's the walks, it's the lectures, it's the, the visits, the children's activities. That's when people really got engaged and that's when new links are made. Um, I think the, um, the multi-channel approach as I've rather grandiosely described it of just using that same body of material and using it in the website, in the book and, and the VCH, that was really um, efficient and widened the impact of what we were doing. Um, and, and finally, however much work you do, you're only going to produce a history of a place, not the definitive history. Everybody's got different ideas about what parts of heritage they would like to see explored most and what matters most to them and to their families. Um, inevitably, not, not just because of um, the problems of access, accessing some of the archives, there are whole areas that we weren't able to explore properly. But hopefully the groundwork's been done so that people in the future can build on what's been done here and take their engagement with, with our local heritage into new directions that, that interest them. Um, and we're sort of actively trying to encourage people to do that. Um, this is definitely not the end of the activity. Uh, it's, it feels like a major milestone. Um, and uh, there are some um, other ideas for, for future work. Um, we'd love to do some more field work looking at those potential Roman sites. Um, uh, I'm convinced there's something there, something more there than we found to date. As I said earlier, I'd like to do some, I think we, sh we could push our material um, further into, into the schools and produce some more educational material. Um, we're very pleased with our heritage app and interestingly, a number of um, other towns and, and parishes are looking at doing something similar um, and uh, Craig is going to help us expand what we do, and he's in the process of also uh, um, uh, launching some other um, local trail apps, which I think feels like a very powerful way of engaging with people um, and technology and the local heritage. We'll also do some leaflets um, using that same material from the app, giving people um, uh, some paper um, leaflets to use rather than just um, the apps. Ultimately, we'd like to do a, have on the website a gazetteer, a record of every house, whether it was built in the 15th century or the 1970s, so that somebody who wants to know about the house they're living in or they're going to buy or that their grandparents lived in, they've got somewhere to go for a, a central repository of information. It's no small task to try and keep the website up to date, but we'd like to try and do that and, and keep it refreshed. Um, and uh, that there is an appetite um, for for more for more training um, and to, to, to explore uh, archives more some of the archives we weren't able to get into in more detail. So there's plenty to keep people going. Right, that's all that um, we had planned to say. And I'm happy to um, take questions um, uh, as as people are interested in. I see we've got a couple already, David. 
Yeah, fantastic. So, so, so interesting. Such a wonderful story. And and if I can just add, um, sort of my personal take on the, uh, on the book. And having seen what John Harris produced, I'm just absolutely amazed by the quality. No, I suppose I suppose I shouldn't be amazed. I'm really um, impressed by the quality of the of the publication. And just following on from that, Jan has said, "Are you going to print any more books so that they're more easily available?" Um, probably. <laughs> I mean, the, the economics of, of uh, we, we, we um, uh, John could talk about this in detail, but he's not able to. He's just he's a passive participant on this, on this occasion. Um, but the, we went for the highest quality printing approach, which is not digital on demand. Um, so that would have made it easier if we'd gone down the digital on demand route. But we will certainly take orders. And, we, and, and there are some copies left if people do want them. Um, drop me an email. There's, you can um, place an order on the website. And as, as I mentioned earlier, Waterstones in Chippenham have some. Uh, there's probably some still in the Wiltshire Museum, um, and there's probably some in the Chippenham Museum. So that, that it's not yet become a scarce collector's edition, but um, we will we will produce some um, some more. Uh, yeah. Would we do us? Would we do an updated version, Louise? Um, uh, pro <laughs> prob probably not this year. <laughs> And then someone's asked about uh, names, a couple of different ones. First, the family name Edmonds, and secondly, Melson Wood. Um, I'm going to throw that to you, Louise, but I, 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 unless, unless Louise has got an encyclopedic knowledge, I uh, No, I, I think Melson Wood's more uh, Christian Malford than Bramhill. I didn't look into um, the origins of that as a place name, I'm afraid. And um, Edmonds, I don't think that featured heavily in our research. Um, the the family name isn't in the book, I'm afraid. I mean, what 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 is fascinating, isn't it, Louise? Is how many family names just crop up time and time again <laughs> over three, four, five hundred years. Um, you know, it's the it's the the Minters, the Peglers, the Gingles, the um, uh, the uh, vines is i mean that that the, the uh, free guards that 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 there really is a, a solid core of a dozen or so family names that crop up again and again and beth has asked what platform was used for the heritage app or is it bespoke oh blimey um <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that i louise i don't suppose you do uh, no, I'd have to ask Craig. Um, but but I know that Craig's very happy to um, talk to anybody else who's interested in uh, Heritage App. So he is our sort of webmaster. So contact him through the website if you yeah. if you want to learn more about how we did the uh, the app. And, and I'd encourage Perhaps you to download it. It's free, obviously, um, and uh, there's quite a lot of, of, of in depth information there. Um, and we'd be open to ideas as to how we could improve it. And perhaps Craig could type the name of the um, some basic info into the um, uh, into the chat, and also perhaps um, the link for you could give the link for the website as well in there and where to download it. And Julie has asked which archive material did the group enjoy working with most? Me personally. Um... I love Vestry Minutes and uh, Overseers accounts. So um, <laughs> stuff pertinent to their welfare, because I'm really a historian of um, welfare provision in my academic work. So, um, and because there was so much of it for Bram Hill, it got me very excited. <laughs> and I think we had a pretty rich set of wills and inventories, didn't we, Louise, that, 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 that really, that was, and that's a quite an accessible way if you're looking to bring in relative novices it's it's very human um, we even found a few of houses that were existing and trying to work out which rooms were being referred to and and you you get a fascinating insight into the um the economics and the status of of families um from the listings of of, of what they regarded as valuable yeah, I mean, we had we have hundreds of wills and some of them have inventories and it's those inventories which were so illuminating, although some of the wills um, uh, were interesting too. Um, we've got a, a, a write up actually within the book about um, the fact that through the wills we discovered what could have been um, a secret marriage. Um, so, yeah. 
it's amazing what you can discover. And a question from Mike. He said, do you know why there's a Pegler's Way and the Foxham Way in the new Witchelstow development in, on the south side of Swindon? Uh, yeah, it, it, it beggars belief that it'll confuse people for years to come why, they, why, they, why there's another Foxham Way there. But, but um, some planner decided that's what he wanted to, to give it a bit of Wiltshire colour. I can think of no other, no other good reason. And uh, where are we? Jan has uh, said, has asked if there's facilities to ask questions on the website. <laughs> <laughs> nice hard um, ones. And you, that, do you get marked out of 10 as well? Um, I don't think we've got that, but there is, there's certainly a contact, the contact details. Um, I mean, it, it, at, at the risk of being unhelpful, um, we probably aren't set up to sort of help people with individual inquiries into their family or or um you know ancestors um uh we would gently steer people towards the uh, history center in chippenham um but uh, i think you can search what we've got on the website um and the book has got um a fantastic index in it um and uh, has so there are if th th there are names in there um uh, uh that you can you can search on Plenty of footnotes to explore. <laughs> Hundreds. <laughs> and uh, just my, my colleague Jane says that uh, it's a great book and she's already recommended it to someone who, who was asking about how to write a village history. Thank you. We must send them the recording for this as well, because uh, this, is, uh, this is how to write a great vi village history. Um, another question on the chat. Was there a clockmaker in the parish? Uh, I don't recall coming across a clockmaker. What would you say were some of the unusual professions we did come across? Um, uh, soap maker. Um, uh, I really enjoyed actually writing up the section. Um, not that it was within the parish, but um, quite a few uh, men and boys left the parish to join the Marines for some reason, especially during the Napoleonic Wars. So that was was really fascinating how a landlocked um, county could produce so many um, men and boys willing to go off to war. So, yeah, um, and, and we had—I mean, we had all the normal sort of agriculturally related trades. We did, and there was lots of um, there was lots of uh, woolen cloth manufacture going. Um, on in the village as well for a number of centuries. Obviously farming um, predominated and all the allied trades to that. Yeah, brewing. Uh, some, yeah, I mean, some thing. women in surprising roles. I think there was a female blacksmith turned up in a trade directory in the mid 1850s. Um, uh, also there was, uh, I, in the 17th century, there was at least, it's not a, a job, but there was one woman who was elected as um, a church warden. There were female uh, highway surveyors, which was again, very unusual, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question, what are the medieval churches within the parish? You mentioned three. Um, there is, well, Fox, Foxham's not medieval, um, but the, uh, the, um, to the, to the, to the Lucas and Bremhill are definitely medieval. Yeah, so St. Nicholas at um, Tiverton Lucas and St. Martin's at Bremhill. Um, the original church at Foxham was, um, well, the Victorians, the late Victorians decided to demolish it and start again. And, it, and it's so frustrating because it, it existed um, uh, at least in um, 1305, probably before. So we don't really know um, very much about how it looked, although there are there's at least one illustration of it in the book. But um, yeah. Um, somebody was <coughs> somebody's asking um, what the budget, how the budget was spent. I'm, I don't think it's appropriate to go into, into microscopic detail, but. Um, you know, Louise is a professional historian. She she worked um, for a an agreed rate as part of the we sort of let a contract to her as part of this. That would have been one of the bigger items. Um, and there was other 
um, costs that we incurred, um, uh, in, and then of course the costs of the production of the book. I mean, I, I have to say, um, producing local history books is not a profitable activity. And there's obviously things like um, hiring the, the the hall and Zoom costs and yeah, yeah, printing all the, all the, and the flyers sure, and the, the it's amazing and... how all the costs just stack up that people you, you just don't think about when you start a project, which is why it's so important to get the budget right. Yeah, you know, and you know, we we we, we as I said earlier, we we chose to um, pay for professionals, you know, and and we we had some professional editing support, we had some professional. Uh, indexing support. We had some. Uh, no, we didn't have indexing support. We had we had proof copying support. We had um, we had some significant IT um, professional IT support producing the website and the and the um, and the and the app. So, um, you know, we we part of what infused the the steering group and what brought people together was producing high quality outputs. And you know, I I would. To turn turn the question around, um, I would caution against setting yourself ambitious targets without um, uh, some some reasonable financial wherewithal. I think y you can certainly do it, but but I, I, I think you're going to need to have an awful lot of goodwill um, and support, and perhaps cut your cloth accordingly. And and at different times, we 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 you know we we definitely had to um, economise on how we how we approach things. Okay, I think that's the last of the questions, unless anyone's got a, a last quick one. In which case, if I can just add my, uh, just say how much I've enjoyed listening to the talk. Oh, I know, there was one I was going to ask Martin, because Louise had a chance to give her favourite story that uh, she <laughs> uncovered. We haven't heard Martin's. Well, um... <laughs> um... Uh, well, the one, past, the one you think you might be able to talk about in company, yet, David. Um, so, so I can't really go into detail. But we we did discover that quite a lot of of sexual shenanigans um, uh, with, with, with within within the parish um, evenly spread around the villages. Um, but that that was certainly fascinating. Um, I no, I mean it. You know, there, there was there was some some fantastic um, fantastic human stories. Um, that, that we discovered that, that that really are you know um, in, in, enriching you know that, that, that and, and it certainly leads one to believe that um, even though the the complexion of the village changed um, over time um, really quite late in the story as it were from from a principal agricultural focus into a, into a more today's um, much more um, varied um, uh, support Pe people people are people. Um, and, and I guess just to, at the risk of sounding slightly pretentious, what what I enjoy is just the whole process of looking at national events and trends through a local lens. So um, Louise talked about you know the anti the anti corn law league. You know that was a seismic event um, uh, of its time, and and we've got a fantastic up up front viewpoint on it from a very to see the pain it was causing and to see how people protested it and, you know and that those sort of and there's dozens of those examples of, of, of uh, ha looking at the impact of of national um, trends hitting the local level and um, Louise mentioned at the end of her talk the some of the sort of social support um, areas genuinely surprising to see medical support and 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 um, proper goodwill and I think it would be fair to say Louise it was better done when the parish was in control than when it drifted um to to to, to Carn and Chippenham uh yeah it's certainly the welfare provision yeah um yeah it, it all changed in 1835 1836 with the Paula Amendment Act so yeah Bremhill was joined with others um in welfare provision and it just completely fundamentally changed yeah um and, and, and I and I, I think just again this is intended to help people give people encouragement if that the trying to do something like the festival i mean we're certainly not trying to take on the chalk valley history festival um, whether, whether whether we do another one what it looks like is we've got a meeting in a few weeks time to decide quite what we want to do next but just you know people were fascinated by local talks and local information people who've lived here 40 50 60 years just said they learned an awful lot more about what was around them so it's that that aspect of it is 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 um, very rewarding too. 
Fantastic. Beth, Beth, Sarah and Mike have all said thank you very much for your talk on the chat. And if I can add my thanks as well. Um, absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. It's really illuminating and really is a, a best practice in how to write a, a community history and working with Victoria County history. Absolutely brilliant. So with that, if I can thank you both and thank everyone for coming and good night. Bye. Bye. Thanks, David. <laughs>